So let's get started. Uh, today we are doing chapter 9 on virtual memory. And chapter 9 is a continuation from chapter 8 last week when we looked at main memory. So virtual memory. Um, it's really not that much of a different concept uh, except for some of the um, manipulation of the memory. So we'll take a look at the concept of it. I'll define virtual memory for you, the background information. Look at demand paging. Uh, look at copy on write, page replacement algorithms, and allocation of frames, along with the concept of thrashing, memory mapped files, allocation of kernel memory, as well as some other considerations and some operating system examples. So the objective is to essentially define what this virtual memory environment is and explain the concept of demand paging. Um, so last time we looked at, just refresh your memory, the concept of main memory. Main memory was the operating system's abstraction of your physical memory as it's translated into logical versus physical addressing. We looked at and defined the page table, and the page table was what was keeping track of the uh, mapping itself from the physical to the, lo to the logical. And in the page table, we had things like dirty bits and clean, or actually it was just a dirty bit, whether it was set to on or off, meaning that the page was actually loaded versus not loading. We looked at the concept of the page fault, where the CPU goes over to the page table and finds out whether or not uh, the page is actually loaded. And if it is, uh, leave it alone and use it. If not, it triggers a page fault. Page fault is nothing more than a command that goes back and says to the kernel, uh, try, that, try that again. Um, because it's not loaded. So it goes back and will load the page that's missing. Uh, so what we're going to do is continue the concept, look at the page replacement aspect of it. Um, how do we replace pages? Um, because we're, eventually we're going to run out of room. Look at the uh, concept of the page frame uh, and the frames themselves, which we really haven't looked at yet, and then discuss the principles of the working set model in a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate too much on it, just give you an overview of it. Um, so in terms of the background, virtual memory by definition is again the separation of the logical memory from the physical memory. When we talk about page replacement, when we talk about managing the memory, we really refer to it as virtual. It could be called main memory, it could be called logical memory. There's different names for it. You never call it physical memory because it's not physical memory. It's a total operating system abstraction. But it's very commonly called virtual memory because modern day virtual memory managers are working with page replacement and they're working with um, terminology that would be appropriate for a, for a main memory, virtual memory type of environment. So only part of the program needs to be in memory for execution. Um, <clears throat> so going back to the beginning of what I was talking about in terms of memory, we have so, many, we have so much physical memory on the board and then we take that physical memory and we map it into logical or virtual memory, it's still not going to be enough for everything that we have loaded, and it's not going to be enough to store, um, you know, 25, 30 copies of one program or something. Um, because if you think about multi-using environment, user double-clicks on something, it's going to load something in the memory. User double-clicks on something else again, it's also going to load it up into memory. All this stuff's not going to fit. <clears throat> so the concept of the virtual memory is basically a scheme for logically locating bits and pieces of the program that are needed when the program is running. And most virtual memory managers take a just-in-time sort of approach to it. Um, load it up into memory just when we need it. If we don't need it, don't load it up into memory. So the logical address space <clears throat> can therefore be much larger than the physical address space. And this allows address spaces to be shared by several different processes and allows more efficient process creation. So what, essentially what we're doing is loading stuff up into memory as minimal as possible so that we can you know, pr preserve the resource and then allocate to as many processes as possible. So it does really facilitate this virtual memory environment, does really facilitate a nicely running system. Virtual memory can be implemented via demand paging or demand segmentation. I talked about paging last time. Paging um, is essentially the concept of taking a bunch of frames and allocating them to a page. And we have that page table that's keeping track of all of our pages that are associated with all of the frames. I'm not going to review all that stuff again. Go take a look at lecture 8, uh, last week's lecture, and you can get a, a good feel for what paging is about. Most of the virtual memory managers of today's operating systems are using a demand paging. 
And the demand paging basically says page it, but don't page it until it's needed. Wait, and then create the page, allocate the page. So it's going back to that just-in-time kind of characteristic. It's more effectively done when you load it in when it's needed. Because why load something if you don't need it? And then why unload something if you don't need it? So we delay the unloading until we need the space, and we delay the loading until we're actually going to use it. And then the segmentation is the programmer's or the user's perspective of the program instead of the memory perspective. So in terms of what demand segmentation is about, if we're using a segmentation approach, which we're using in some of these operating, in most operating systems, we're using a combination of paging and segmentation, the demand segmentation is going to say, well, don't load it again, don't link the, UI, don't link the DLL or load the DLL or the shared object or whatever it is we happen to be looking at until it's needed. And a segmentation, uh, going back to the concept, is nothing more than the abstraction of the program units. So it could be the modules, the classes, it could be, um, you know, libraries, it could be any kind of segment of the program that's loaded that's used in terms of that abstraction. So here's our virtual memory that is larger than our physical memory, which is why we're, well, I wouldn't say why, but it's one of the reasons why we're doing this. We only have so much physical memory, we can make it 10 times as big, 20 times as big if we want to, by just creating a virtual abstraction of it, which is what this slide is showing us. So this is the physical memory here, and the virtual memory is over here, and the memory mapping, and last time we looked at this we called this a page table, um, but it's really just a map. <coughs> the map is going to take and map it to, this is the backing store over here on the side, or you could call it a swap drive. And uh, it's going to take and map the physical locations to the virtual locations and give us that generic abstraction that comes out of it because we don't want to look at physical addresses. Every physical address we see is going to be different. And it depends on the computer architecture. Um, in fact, we don't even look at the physical memory. We look at the memory management unit. So if you wanted to, you could put like a little MMU right in between here and the memory map <coughs> would actually go to the MMU, which would be the physical memory. So, And then we're constantly swapping, and we, I talked about swapping, or the concept of swapping last time as well, when we need to swap something out, because this is going to fill up. The physical memory will fill up. And so if we have twice as much of it abstracted out over here, and we fill this up, and we want to add more to it, Eventually, we're going to have to unload something. In order to run that piece of memory, in order to actually execute the instruction, we need it loaded in the physical memory. So although this is, because another question that students usually come up with is, why do we need the physical memory then? Or what, you know, is that, this is actually performing the memory functionality. It's mapped to many different virtual pages. And so we can selectively keep track of these virtual pages, load them and unload them when they're going to be run, when the process is, is, is actually getting CPU time. And they get loaded up in the physical memory. And then when we run out of physical memory, which is what we're going to do, because we have twice as much paging going on, then take that, put it on the backing store. And then if it's on the backing store, this is a temporary memory layout that's formatted sort of like the physical memory. And so one piece will come out, one piece will come back in, and this is what's referred to as swapping. <clears throat> so this piece goes out, this piece comes back in, and then uh, we can essentially create the abstraction so everything is loaded when it needs to be loaded. And that's where that valid or the dirty bit comes into. It's, it's usually called a, a valid bit or a dirty bit, <clears throat> and it indicates if the page is over here and it's loaded and it's mapped, is it loaded right here? If it's not loaded right here, that's when that page fall occurs. And then the instruction has to go all the way back up to the start and say, okay, load it. <laughs> it's not loaded. It's not valid. Because it could be here, but not here. And it's here. And if it's here and not here, it's an invalid page because the page that it's supposed to be mapped to out here is being used by somebody else. So this piece of physical memory belongs to somebody else. If we use it, we're going to get the wrong instruction. Or we're going to get the wrong piece of data. So the whole key is in this mapping, and the memory map is where we're going to keep that valid or that invalid bit. Um, the dirty bit is really referred to as, is it dirty? If we wrote it out once already, it's already on the backing store. If it hasn't changed, it hasn't gotten dirty. If it's changed, it's now a dirty piece of memory that needs to be cleaned up. So 
it needs to be written out again. Because the way the scheme works, we want to minimize the amount of swapping, minimize the amount of reading and writing, and have everything loaded just before it needs to be used. So if we do have to unload something to make room for something else, and the bit is dirty, we have to, write, we have to, we have to spend more time actually writing it to the backing store. If it's already in the backing store, and it's been loaded, it needs to be unloaded, and it's clean, it hasn't changed, well, why write it again? So you save yourself some extra time by not having to write it. And that's pretty much what we covered in the last lecture. So in this particular lecture, we're going to take the concept a little bit further and talk about what happens in terms of the um, uh, page replacements and in terms of the swapping and in terms of how the system is actually working from an execution point of view. Here's the virtual memory space that is allocated to a process. <clears throat> and this is just memory from zero to some maximum length. And uh, in here we have the code. You know, this is going to be the instructions. We have data that's allocated. And then we have the heap and the stack. The, I usually like to draw the stack down here and put the heap up here. But they're really two, two growing together. The heap is empty memory that's left over, which is kind of like why I like to put it up here. To figure, you know, load everything up, and then you got some memory up here. And the memory up here is going to grow from this direction down this direction. Um, and in this particular case, because we switched it, we put it upside down. We got the heap; it's going to grow this way. The stack's going to grow this way. The stack is where all of our instructions are being placed for the CPU, for the CPU scheduler. So the data is going to be, you know, we say integer i, i is equal to one. Integer b, integer h create all these integers or floats or doubles and things, let's say, for creating a C program. <clears throat> and we have data bits or data pieces. It'll be stored in this particular area along with other data pieces. When we have an instruction that says 1 plus 1 or I plus A is equal to something, assign it to something, those are instructions that are going to be loaded on a stack. And the data structure does work like a stack. You push on about five different, six different instructions or however big the stack is supposed to be. Then you pop off the instructions and they get executed. And then that's what the CPU is actually running. It's running those instructions. And it's done, the CPU scheduler is directing the traffic to whatever I.O. or whatever resource those instructions happen to need. And then the you know, instruction will sit and get executed, hopefully. <clears throat> and then everything gets worked through the stack. Stack empties out. So the stack just naturally grows this way. When we dynamically allocate memory in a program, let's say we're back to C++, or C. And uh, I talk about C or C++ in terms of this model because Java doesn't use this. Java runs in its own JVM and the JVM organizes the process space. So Java is like an operating system on top of an operating system. And the concept is a little bit different because it's, most, it's not allocated per process. The memory is actually uh, configured slightly differently so that programs can actually share memory. This doesn't facilitate any memory sharing. In fact, this doesn't facilitate much except for a single process running on an island of its own. You can create another process inside of this, so we'd get a copy of it. But in terms of the way your modern day C C++ program works in this runtime environment that's mimicked through this abstraction of this process that is nothing more than information loaded in memory, in terms of how that's running, each process is pretty much separated out abstraction wise. And the hardest part in a C++ programming and operating system manipulation is making the processes communicate um, in terms of inter-process communication or leaving them alone and having them not write into each other's memory space. And in that particular case, you know, everything works great until one process does something wrong and messes up another process. And then you get the blue screen of death and everything goes away and you reboot the computer, essentially. But, uh, but going back to the heap concept, when the heap, how does the heap fill up? Well, in a C++ program, when you say, <clears throat> you know, give me a new object, give me a new integer, give me a new float, the new operator, which is creating dynamic memory, all the dynamic memory is loaded on the heap. So heap memory is going to be our dynamically allocated. If we're in a C++, C, not a C++, that would be the malloc, you know, running a malloc, um, to allocate memory. And uh, that grows up, the stack grows up. So one of two things is going to happen. We're going to get a stack overflow error. Um, that would happen, let's say, if we had a program that had a recursive function call, and the recursive function call kept going over and over again but never stopped. That would fill up the stack, and that would grow into the heap. 
Or in uh, other cases, we would get out-of-memory error. And out-of-memory error would, would happen if we allocated dynamic memory with inside of the process, kept allocating and allocating and allocating, but never deallocated it. That would give us a memory overflow um, type of error message, uh, which is really the only two things that really happened in this. I mean, either, or we have a bad instruction. We had bad code. Or we have missing code or the executable file has been hit by a virus and the code is in the wrong format now or something. Um, but the data is uh, handled by the stack instructions, so that doesn't usually go wrong either. So, <clears throat> In terms of shared libraries, and uh, going back to the thing I said about Java, uh, this is a Windows. Windows, you know, pretty typical. And again, this is not exactly like the Windows runtime process, but it is close enough. Um, to be used as an example. And every textbook will use this particular representation to show you. You know, if you could look at a process in memory, this is what it would look like. I've never actually seen a process in memory, personally, <laughs> because it doesn't exist. It's an abstraction. But, yeah, I think that would, was what it would look like. If we were looking more along the lines of a shared library, what we would have is the same components as we have before, and this is really two processes sharing the same piece of memory. This process over here has its own stack and heap and data and code. This one over here has its own set as well. And what we have in between is that shared memory. And the shared memory is going to go with the shared pages, and that's what they're going to have in common. So the allocation of this particular memory here is going to be at a different location. <clears throat> and if we use paging for this, we can actually facilitate inter process communication, like what this, this slide is actually showing you, is inter process communication. Uh, because you have two processes that are sharing the same page in memory. If you do this, <clears throat> they can work on you know a common task, they can share work, they can divide things out, or, and they can communicate with each other. Uh, so this model itself, this might actually be, let's say for example, a dynamically linked library or a shared object. I'm sure everybody in here has <clears throat> heard of a DLL. In fact, you've really heard of one when you've seen the error messages come up on Windows systems and you go, missing DLL. And you go, oh, what happened with that? Well, only on a Windows system do we have what the DLL stands for, dynamically linked library. The DLL would be located in one of these shared spaces. And uh, <coughs> the DLL is nothing more than program source code similar to a driver that enables functionality. And the source code of the library you want to call it a library, maybe it would be a better way of describing it. <clears throat> it might be used for, let's say, a printer or a fax machine or, um, you know, some interface to some program that's running. Usually the DLL is associated with some resource that's on the computer somehow. And then the shared memory would make it so that one copy of that DLL could be used by every single process. And so in the Windows operating system, that's what we get, actually. You load up Windows reboot your computer, what you're getting is a bunch of DLLs. If you search, you probably have more the DLLs than anything else on your computer. And those DLLs are loaded up in the memory by the operating system at startup. And then your programs are getting to them. So when you write uh, Visual Studio, uh, C++, or any Visual Basic, or any of the Visual ASPs, any of the Visual Studio packages, they're all using shared DLL libraries, and they're common Windows libraries for Windows MFC, the Microsoft Foundation classes, which gives you the window, gives you the controls. That's all native window, you know. So you're not, or Windows, I should say. You're not, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're reusing, and you're reusing through DLLs, and the DLLs are linked. And how they're running is really efficient if you think about it. And I was actually, I was kind of impressed uh, when I first started reading about, you know, this is back in the Windows 3.0 days. We didn't have as many, and then all of a sudden, past 3.0, I'm like. 95, but Windows 95-ish, all of a sudden this DLL came out like in widespread popularity. <laughs> and then users can create their own DLLs as well. And uh, it's efficient. And going back to what I said in the beginning of this lecture, we don't have enough memory to load everything that's humanly possible for every program. So if programs shared files and shared memory, we could load up certain dynamically linked libraries or shared objects. And the programs can call it and use it, similar to this slide here, access the shared library. And uh, these are smaller, taking up less space. <coughs> this is being shared. It's not being loaded and unloaded, loaded and unloaded. It just sits there. 
and it runs and it provides services to all of the other processes and it actually speeds up not only the memory usage but it speeds up the operating system um, and it makes it so that we can share things and we don't have to load our own copy. If we're loading our own copy and we had let's say functionality that was included in a DLL we'd be doing this and every single process would be loading it would require more memory. So programs that use DLLs don't take up as much memory because they're all calling to the same program. But the, really that wasn't even why it was invented either. The reason why it was invented is it kind of goes back to the Unix, Linux days. In Unix they called them .SOs, or shared objects. And utilities like Perl and Python and, well I shouldn't say Python, Perl does it. We would have libraries or packages that are made by other people and it was a way of compiling it, giving you a .so file, which was source code. I mean, excuse me, it was binary code. It wasn't source code that you could look and steal. And then you could create programs that ran on Perl, you know, or you could create programs that ran, in fact, C C++ run the same way. G and U C runs the same way. In fact, they call them .o files, or object files. What we get is object code, and then the object code gets linked, and the link is basically happens at compile time for C or C++. Java implemented the same thing. So this is sort of like a Java environment as well, but instead of Java having DLL files or .o files, which are pretty much the same thing, or .so, so o would be object, so would be shared object, DLL is dynamic, and linked library, all representing the same concept of taking binary code, sticking it out there, loading it up into memory, and having programs call it. So they don't have to make it themselves. They don't have to load it themselves. It's already loaded. And on every, all the programs are using it. Well, they uh, <coughs> Java did the same thing, except for all class files. So everything is a dot class. And it's, they're all objects, because it's a true object-oriented environment. So every object that gets loaded is already loaded and is accessible by other objects. So you might think of this more along the lines of, instead of this, Runtime support, just look at all the shared memory, and instead of having each process being managed by each class, we have Java operating system support that goes out and manages all the memory and tells this class file where this class file is located. And we have resource managers, essentially, in Java that take the place of the CPU scheduler, take the place of the runtime environment, but do the same functionality orchestrate who's got what in memory, and if it's loaded, then use it, essentially. So it's all dynamically linked, dynamically loaded. So, And one last thing to mention about, because you're, you're getting a short lesson in runtime environment comparisons and contrasts as well <laughs> in this, but it's really hard to talk about uh, memory and memory, virtual memory management without speaking of at least how the process abstraction is working in terms of the memory allocation. Uh, but taking this a little step further, the linking is a one of the other, other components that's involved in this whole memory configuration. If we statically allocate everything, which means we create a .exe file or .com file, and we run it on the computer, everything is compiled. So you know it's not it's not a not a hybrid or it's not a script. It's a compiled kind of concept, and all of the objects are linked in together. So the object code is linked physically to the file. Switch that around, that's, that's a C++ environment. So out here, the R program that's running knows about the myprinter or hp.dll file. It's going to load my HP printer or something. And it's already hard set in here where that's located. And it's, it's already identified at a compile time. And they usually refer to that as statically linked libraries. So statically linked libraries happen at compile time. And the reason why we call those DLLs because they are dynamically linked libraries, which means, better yet, don't statically link it, <laughs> but put a stub in there, and the stub knows it needs a file, but the file can move. So as we're orchestrating this virtual memory, it doesn't matter where it is in memory, it doesn't matter as long as the name stays the same, the name of the file, and it gets loaded. If it's not loaded, it can load, and it can, at load time, or at link time, link itself, establish the connection between it. And uh, Java does that with everything, 
C, uh, excuse me, Microsoft Windows does it only with the DLLs. So the DLL is the dynamically linked portion, which means you can, another vendor can make another DLL. You can download. In fact, what you're doing when you download updates is you're getting new DLL files most of the time. You can replace the DLL, unload the DLL, load the DLL again. It's a lot more flexible if you do it dynamically than it is to do it statically. And that's essentially what Java took advantage of in terms of creating its own. And a lot of people ask, well, why did Java have to create their own operating system for their own language? And it's because it, for this particular reason alone, the runtime environment is completely different. Everything's dynamic. There's nothing static anymore. And we have hybrid code. We get everything that's, that, that's compiled but not linked. And it's compiled into you know an intermediate binary code, so it's not readable. Although there's descramblers all over the place, but theoretically it's made into runnable code that's in a binary format, machine kind of specific. But nothing is linked, so that's why when you compile Java files, you get you know one program you have 25 different dot Java dot excuse me class files out of that. And you know, so how does that work? Well, you load it all in one directory, or you configure your Java environment to know where to look for the files. You load one file, and it will load the rest of the files for you automatically. It doesn't happen in Windows. <laughs> it doesn't happen because Windows is using this kind of configuration. And Java is using everything is this way. There's no separate process. It's just all the memory itself is being managed together. So. Anyway, that was a short lesson on the differences between the runtime environments between uh, Java and Windows. But it comes in handy, especially to know what it is in terms of the background. Because when we start talking about swapping and demand paging, um, you're going to go, well, I don't understand what in the world you're talking about. <laughs> well, it gets down to the fact that you need a little background in how the processes are abstracted and how they're loaded in memory. So let's talk about demand paging. So maybe maybe this will make more sense to you now. <laughs> Demand paging occurs when you bring a page into memory only when it's needed. So I said about that just in time. So it takes up less I.O. In fact, it makes things load faster. Windows is uh, what would be considered a demand paging environment because what you're doing is um, loading up the operating system only what's needed, only the drivers that are being loaded are actually being are actually functioning. That's why people in the beginning used to go through and modify their registry, you know, take out stuff they weren't using, because why load DLL files? And you can actually save yourself a little bit of memory. Now with Windows 7, it's a lot more optimized. In fact, I don't recommend changing or modifying that registry file, but if you think about the concept, if you go online and look at it and just, just look, just Google registry cleanup or something, tons of third-party utilities out there to clean up the register, you know. <laughs> And the main, major focus on that was remove items that are needed. Interesting thing is the operating systems have changed. I mean, in the beginning that was the case, but with Windows 7, actually, and actually it kind of started with XP, the later XP Service Pack 3, I believe, was implementing this. It didn't load everything that was in the registry. The registry can be as big as you want. It doesn't matter. Unless you're actually using the program, it's not going to get loaded. So, in fact, that's how Windows actually started loading up a little faster. Because why, why, if you're not going to use it, you know. So now it loads up faster, but everything you run initially runs a little slower. Because it's got to load all the DLL support. It's got to load everything needed. But it's a lot more efficient because you can have a smaller resource of memory, allocate a lot of stuff to it, and only use what you need to use. And it's kind of like planning ahead, thinking ahead. So less I.O. is needed, <clears throat> less memory is needed faster response time and more users. More people can use the system simultaneously. More applications can run. It's more efficient. So paging is needed uh, or a reference to it. Reference to pages. And this is where we're getting into that invalid reference. Is it in memory, not in memory? And I'll talk about a little bit about the concept um, in terms of if it's an invalid reference, it means you know we're going to have to abort and try it again, make sure we have a valid reference. And the reference itself is referring to, is it actually loaded? And is this frame, does it actually contain the information that's supposed to be in this page? And if not, then we have to fix it and make it contain what it needs to contain. And we have this thing called a lazy swapper. As I mentioned before, going back to this picture here, it said, uh, showed us this, this is our swapping activity. So. 
our valid or invalid information is coming from if it's here and it's not here, it's invalid. It means we need to load it. If it's not here and it's over here, that's a swapping activity, with this being the backing store. The lazy swapper is going to leave it here. It's gonna, it's gonna, unless, we, unless we need the memory, why swap it? So lazy, laser swapping, la lazy swapping, <laughs> waits till the last minute and says, you know, do we need to make room? If we don't need to make room, then don't do anything. So it never swaps a page into memory unless a page will be needed. Never pulls thing out unless it needs to be pulled out to make room. So it waits until the page is actually called, which means you load something up. You, you use it once, let's say, for example. You don't use it again. You may, may never, ever use it again. Maybe not for another week or so, but certainly not within the time that your computer is turned on in this particular session, as an example. Then you've saved yourself a lot of time <laughs> because you didn't swap it in, you didn't swap it out, you just forgot about it. No problem. That was like one of the best things. The lazy swapping concept was actually pretty efficient in terms of that when that was implemented. Swapping that deals with pages is going to be what's called a pager. So we have a pagers and we have swappers. Pagers are page replacement algorithms. And uh, page replacement is what I'm going to get into next. That's where we have selections. That's where we can pick among different algorithms and work with the efficiency of the algorithm in terms of how we're going to facilitate our page replacement. So transfer of the page to memory to contiguous disk space. What we're looking at here and going back to what we've looked at before in the beginning of uh, last lecture on the main memory, talked about how inefficient contiguous allocation was. Uh, so we're not really continuing, we're not really allocating contiguously anymore. And contiguous, uh, if you're not familiar with the word, just means we're sequentially locating the memory. Um, so one piece in the, the whole entire program is basically located together. If it is, you could pull the whole program out just really easily and then put the whole program back in if you wanted to. So here's program A. The entire program can be swapped out and it could be loaded contiguously on the, on the backing store. And then to swap it out, we would remove it, to swap it in, and we take it from the backing store and we put it back in. Continuous memory is actually kind of interesting because not only is it fast and efficient and simple, it works. And uh, primitive type of operating systems actually kind of use it. Uh, only problem is it's not really good for multitasking, uh, especially for most of our Windows systems because you know, we have hundreds of different programs out there. It's hard to allocate the spaces because of what I talked about last time. We have, like, sort of for example, this is a hole right here. It's an empty space. Can't load a whole program in there. And I got one, two holes up here, and I got four holes down here. It makes it hard to allocate a lot because it needs the whole line continuous back to back in order to, to essentially use it. So in a perfect world, the swapping would be quite easy if we were using contiguous, and so would the memory management. However, uh, we have to load a lot of stuff in there because users want to use a lot of programs. They're not going to use one program at a time. So, when you don't use one program at a time, then you got to swap in and you got to swap out. And here's that valid invalid bit that I'm talking about. And the valid invalid bit gets set. Going back to this picture here, I should really put this slide in a little further back, <laughs> so I don't have to keep going back to it. And just to refresh your memory, because if you don't if you don't get the concept of the valid invalid bit, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, this is the last time I'll kind of kind of go through it a little bit. We have a lot more virtual memory than we have physical memory, so these two never match. And when they don't match, we have an invalid bit because we're going to have something loaded here that's not loaded here. And if it's not loaded, it's invalid. Slight chance, however. If it's loaded here, it may be loaded here as well. If it is, it's valid. So what we want to do is minimize the number of invalid bits. Uh, well, that's, that's easier said than done. Uh, because the higher the invalid number of bits, the slower the system runs. Because it has to go back and load something. It's as if it was never loaded at all. So here's our page table from last time. And the page table, if you remember, had well, the original format I gave you had two columns in it. One was the page and the offset. It was basically telling us, uh, you know, where things were from giving us the mapping from the logical to the physical. Now we can add a column, call it a valid and invalid bit. 
put it in here, put a V in here, it's probably going to be a 0 or a 1 to indicate you're never going to see a, a V or an I. In fact, this is an abstraction as well. It's going to be implemented probably in a hash table or something. And um, the V is going to say that it's valid or that it's in memory. And each page table entry is going to have one of these bits set. And they, they call it a bit because it's just an indicator. It's like a switch. So I says it's invalid or not in memory. V says it's valid. So a valid bit is one in which the page that you're looking at, and here we have actually referring to frames, the frames contain the pages, and the pages are valid for the running process that's trying to access it. If the pages don't belong to the process that's running that wants to use it, then it's invalid. And that means we have to basically have a page fault. Higher number of page faults, the more swapping. The swapping occurs when we have to pull it back out of the backing store and put it back into memory and get rid of what's in there because we have to fix the configuration. So those memory pages belong to that process. So the internal uh, initial valid, the invalid bit is also set to I for all entries because it's going to be invalid initially. Nothing's loaded. Here's an example of a page tape page table snapshot where we have the frame number and we have the valid invalid bit on one side. So during the address translation if the valid or invalid bit is in, a pa is in the page table entry the I is basically giving us a page fault. So if it's invalid we're getting a page fault. Here's the page table when some pages are not in main memory. So some of the pages aren't loaded. This is the uh, Logical memory, as I was talking about before, the physical memory. And uh, this is kind of misleading because logical, this looks pretty big. The physical memory looks pretty big. This is really bigger in reality. This is, you know, if I were to read, this is, actually comes out of the textbook. I didn't write the slide, but uh, this I would probably make it like, you know, twice as big as this, just to illustrate the point. Because <sighs> people sometimes think that physical is bigger than logical. It's like, no, <laughs> physical costs money. Those are those boards you're sticking in the computer. <laughs> you know, you can have 8 to 10 gigs now, but you still had to pay at least 50 to 100 bucks now. I mean, although memory is going down in price. And there was one time when it was expensive. This is always going to be smaller. This over here, the logical, is going to be huge. It's free. Yeah, it won't. It's the operating system. So the bigger the logical memory, however, there's a trade-off. The bigger the logical memory, the slower your operating system is going to run. Uh, if you go back to the concept of... Uh, Algorithms and efficiency. Larger the search space, slower the efficiency. The more loops, the more work, the more complicated the algorithm is to go find it in memory. It's kind of like when you have this huge garage and it's hard to find anything in it <laughs> when it's all filled up. But when it's empty, it's kind of easy to find stuff. But when it's all filled up, you have more stuff to go through. If you had itsy bitsy little garage, and you were looking for something, you could probably go through the entire garage in an hour, maybe, or less, and you'd find it easier. So, same concept with memory. There's a compromise. And I, I really couldn't even tell you, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger. You know, Windows 7 has more memory, more logical memory allocated than the previous versions do. Uh, but it got to a certain point, especially in the, in the Vista days, where I don't think, well, I don't think their problem with Vista was associated with memory, but you can get to a certain point where this is too big. It just takes too long. It makes the system run slower. So, and how much multiprocessing? Because this really, this is the level of multiprocessing. And how much multiprocessing is the user really going to do? I mean, what are we going to run? An email program, a web browser, a Microsoft Word, a PowerPoint. You know, and you can probably count up on your on your hands how many applications you're going to have running simultaneously. It's probably going to be less than ten, I would hope. If it is. And if Microsoft can predict that, and I'm sure they have a, some sort of a ratio, it says, yeah, eight programs. It might be interesting to figure out how many programs the user's average user does run simultaneously. That's how you need, that's how big you need to make the logical memory, enough to fit the average amount and then map it correctly. Here we have a page table that's mapping it, and in the page table we have an invalid bit because this one's valid. This one's got four. Four is loading A, so from the logical... A is right here, and C, C is number 2, and number 2 is mapped to number 6, and number 6 has C in it, so you can kind of see how the mapping is working. 
uh, space uh, 9 here. 9 has got F in it. 9 is, F is in 5 over here. This one's valid. These guys are invalid. And then if we were swapping it to the backing store, which is this guy over here, we would have this stuff loaded here as well. We may not necessarily have it loaded here. We're not going to load it here until this fills up. When this fills up, then we load to here, which is why we, you'll always see it in the diagrams with the backing store, sometimes also called the swap drive, located you know, next to the physical memory because that's where the physical memory is dumping out. It's like a temporary memory. This is formatted like this only because it has to dump back and forth. And that's the swapping in and out. And as I mentioned before, the swap drive concept is a Linux or Unix. I may not have mentioned it. It's a Linux or Unix abstraction. The Windows is a backing store abstraction. So it's just another word for a swap drive. And in fact, even in current Windows builds, excuse me, yeah, actually in current Windows builds as well, you can configure the swap drive. And the swap drive is kind of a tricky concept as well, going back to what I said about memory. You know, if you can make unlimited resources, it's going to take longer to go through this. If this was like a thousand, you know, I don't know, make, make it like 200 gigabytes of, you know, memory. You know, your program, your, well, it'll probably take you 10 minutes for each program to load up or to start. Same thing happens here. If the backing store is too big, it takes too long to swap. <laughs> and so it defeats that purpose too. It makes it inefficient. So they always say to make the swapping, swap drive half the size of the memory. So if you have two gigs here, make this one gig or something. And there's a ratio where you can add to it, but you don't want to make it like as humanly big as possible because in that particular case, it's, everything's going to run slowly uh, because the swap space is too big to search. So the page fault. You want to know what a page fault is because this happens all the time. It's not an error. A lot of people, when they you know, first hear the concept of the page fault, they go, oh, that's an error. It's a fault. Why are they called it a fault? I don't know, uh, but there's a reference to a page, and the first reference to that page will trap to the operating system. Trap is a is an is a software generated interrupt, and interrupt normally comes from hardware, uh, but this is a software generated one because it's triggering a page fault because something's in memory is not in memory. It's, it has nothing to do actually with the hardware. So if your CD-ROM, if the door breaks open on it. And, won't shut properly because there's somebody put a coffee cup in the holder or something. You know, who knows what they do with the CD-ROM drives these days. Trailer loop breaks on it. And it's going to send up an interrupt to the operating system. Interrupt handler is going to deal with it. Interrupt handler keeps track of all the activities that are going on. Receives this information, puts it into a table, vector table, and kind of works with it. Goes through and says each one of these has a code associated to it. So if it's the CD-ROM drive, then you know, the code will be, you know, abort, you know, or it will be, you know, disable the CD-ROM drive. It's, this resource isn't going to work. When it catches a page fault as a trap that gets signaled, it goes into the same structure. Kernel looks at this and goes, oh, page fault. Oh, this means something's not loaded into memory. And then it deals with the page fault, which basically sends out another instruction that says, well, then load it into memory. So operating systems look at another table to decide if it's an invalid reference if it is, abort. If not, uh, if it's just not in memory, not in memory at all, then load it in memory. So get the empty page, swap the page into the frame, reset the tables, and then reset the vit to v to make, sh make sure we said, okay, now it's valid, set it to v, and then run the instruction all over again. So restart the instruction that caused the page fault. So page faults make the operating system run slower. I'm going to make the operating system run slower because of all of these activities I just went through on, this, on the screen here, but um, it's going to essentially take CPU cycles to load something. It's more work, essentially. So to restart the instruction, we have what's called a block move. The block move goes from one memory location to another. It might be an auto increment, might be an auto decrement type of location. It's going to find the, the information that it needs to find from the backing store. If it doesn't find it from the backing store, it's going to load it from the main memory excuse me, from the hard secondary storage, wherever the, the code actually is located. Uh, which actually kind of brings up another point uh, that I should mention. I could probably mention it from this slide here, too, because I like this slide a little bit better only because it shows you all the pieces put together. This backing store over here, 
is your hard drive, believe it or not. It is a piece of your hard drive that's not allocated for you as secondary storage. It's allocated to the operating system for use as a backing store. So if you've ever wondered why, this is one of the reasons why, if you've ever wondered why your hard drive is always smaller, you don't get as much hard drive space as what the, the, the box told you. Like a 300 gig hard drive isn't going to give you 300 gigabytes of usable space. Because some of it is going to be used for the backing store. If you install a swap drive, you set the Windows environment to use a swap, you're going to give even less hard drive space. Because it'll all, you'll have a backing store and a swap drive on there. Um, but, you know, hard drives are big these days. We're not really concerned about it. But if you've ever wondered why, it never matches correctly. That's one of the, that's one of the reasons. And it's used for other things as well. Uh, let's go through the process or the steps in handling a page fault. So here's the instruction over here that came out of the runtime environment. And following through with reference number one, there's something that said load M. So um, they go, okay, wait, where's fine? Well, where's M? You know, so number one goes back to the page table. Everything originally just goes to the page table. And as I mentioned before, we can nest the page tables. We can have hierarchical page tables. Or we can have one page table per process. This appears to be one page table per process, the way that this is, this is designed. So when we come back here and we look for it in the page table, we have an I, and the I says it's invalid, which means it's not loaded. Ah, so M's not in memory, because why load M if it's already in memory? So we're going to have to load it. So number two comes around and says, well, here's our trap. Send the page fault up. So the page fault goes to the operating system. You can call this the kernel if you want. Um, and this is in the user mode, actually. So the page fault goes back down to the operating system from a kernel level. It says, hey, we have a page fault. And then following through with step number three, it, the page fault is going to be resolved. And it's going to be first resolved by looking at the backing store. So if this is huge, it's going to search all over in here and go, well, where is it? It's not here. Oh, now we've got to load it from scratch. You know, that's, that's a total waste of time. But luckily it found it right here. So the backing store found it. The page is on the backing store. So it's going to come back out. And number four is going to bring the missing page and put it in to the physical frame. It found a free frame from a free frame list, probably. Brought this page from the backing store. Brought it in and loaded it into the frame. Now it's going to update the page table because we had to know that it's loaded. So then it resets the page table. It comes back up here resets it, this turns into a V, and then the instruction runs all over again. And then now it comes back and says, okay, now we're loaded. This is how our information is actually being loaded into memory. Every single time an instruction is run, the page table is checked to see if it's valid or invalid, and then we have page faults. Imagine the concept of the page fault happening over and over and over again. Let's see what slide was that, number 14. I, I like this one over here because it's, oh, actually this one will work. Mm. Now nah, I like this other one because uh, this one's bigger. Mm. Let's use this one because this this I like this slide because this one in here is bigger. Virtual memory is bigger than the physical. <laughs> Let's say we have a lot of stuff loaded right here. A lot of stuff. Like this is maybe ten times as big as it looks like on a slide. And uh, every single hit is a page fault. Everything everything's invalid because. This can only get one, two, three. We only get maybe you know less than half of what we have over here. Every single instruction that we're running is causing a page fault, and we're swapping out, swapping in, swapping out, swapping in constantly. This is what's called thrashing. A lot of work's getting done. The CPU is really busy at this point. It's taking and accessing all these page faults and working with it and loading every stuff and. But at any one moment of time, there's not enough room here to fit everything here. The process is too big. Let's say we have two huge processes running that are, that are both running simultaneously that we're trying to use. Everything is going to slow down to a, not a complete stop, but it's going to look like it. Because the CPU is going to be busy swapping in, swapping out, swapping in, swapping out, trying to make this whole and complete, but it never gets to that point. So thrashing is when the computer is busy doing absolutely nothing but swapping and none of your programs, none of, nothing is working. That's when you usually get the blue screen of death. <laughs> but you don't get it anymore, now it's a black screen. But you don't even get that anymore, instead you get memory fault error or you get 
Oh, there's a classic message that comes up. It says, system is low on memory. If your system says it's low on memory, it's because your me virtual memory manager is thrashing. It's thrashing too much. And when it says that, it wants you to shut the computer off and turn it back on. Because there's stuff loaded on the backing store, there's stuff loaded in memory that is still there, but you may or may not necessarily be using it because there was a mistake or something happened in the algorithm. And it's the computer is thrashing too much. The operating system mechanism is loading, unloading, loading, and the swapping is way too high as a percentage. And how do we know the percentage? Let's go into the performance a few for a few minutes. Um, so the operating system itself can keep its own statistics. It knows when it's thrashing. It knows when to send up the blue screen of death. It knows when to put the low in memory, out of memory. And when you know, how can I be out of memory? I got 10 gigs of RAM on this thing. Yeah, it's possible <laughs> if the algorithm is messed up or something happened. Uh, but let's take a look at performance of demand paging for a second. If the page fault is a uh, page fault rate is can be measured, and the page fault rate is going to tell us how efficient and how fast the system is running. The higher the page fault rate, the slower the system. We get it to a certain point, we end up in the thrashing category, and at that particular point, just turn the thing off and turn it back on. Here we have a zero is less than or equal to p, which is going to be less than or equal to 1.0. So if zero is, if p is equal to zero, there's no page faults. So p, p, if p is equal to 1, every reference is a page fault. So it's going to range from 0 to 1, and uh, we want it to be 0. We want it to be empty. Because we have what's called the efficient access time, or the EAT, which is equal to 1 minus p, where we have x is the memory access plus the page fault, page fault overhead. Page fault overhead is the swapping, plus the swap out, plus the swap in, plus the restart of the overhead. And then we can kind of figure out, you know, and our operating system is going to be doing this because it's trying to keep track of, you know, do you have the memory management correct? You know, if you've ever gone into the Windows uh, control panel and the system and into environment or into and looked at some of the settings, let Windows adjust it. <laughs> A lot of people like try to put their own numbers in there and make it 1024 and make it this and make it that and they try to configure it. The thing is, the Windows operating system is the kernel is calculating all this information. And it can adjust itself. And it can make the backing store bigger, make the virtual memory smaller, can reconfigure itself to get an acceptable EAT or an acceptable uh, speed. Where the user, you're not knowing exactly what's going on. That's why I was wondering why do people set that themselves? When you know, just let the operating system do it automatically. So here's a demand paging example where we had the memory access time is equal to 200 nanoseconds. The average page fault service time is, let's say, equal to 8 milliseconds. Because each one of those page faults that occurs has what's called a service time associated with it. And the service time is how, to, how long does it take to fix the page fault? You know, to make, put, the, put the piece of memory from the backing store back into the memory so we can use it. So the EAT is going to be equal to 1 minus P times 200 times P. Well, anyway, I'm not going to go through the entire calculation. Uh, you can go through it on your own. But we can add the same formula for the EAT that we've seen on the previous slide. Plug the numbers in, and you can kind of figure out that how, you know, as a particular example, how effective is it going to be. So if one access out of 1,000 causes a page fault in this particular example, then the EAT is 8.2 microseconds. This is a slowdown by a factor of 40. Um, so we can kind of tell, given the... Uh, page fault service time given the memory access time uh, and given the page fault rate, how, how many page faults we have. We're going to say how much is this demand paging, how much of it is you know, putting a, slowing down our system, you know, how, how is it making it in, inefficient essentially. Uh, but this inefficiency is due to our multitasking, our, our non-contiguous memory allocation. If we go back to a contiguous memory allocation we have a better world, but we can't multitask. We can't load everything up. You know, it doesn't work that way. So we have some uh, issues with in terms of process creation. Uh, so we have virtual memory that allows other benefits during the process creation. We can do what's called a copy on write, or we could do memory mapped files. And we'll talk about later. Copy on write is kind of an interesting concept, and this is when we're creating these processes. Well, going back, I'm not going to go back to that slide in the beginning, but 
we looked at the process space when we were allocating that. Our copy on right allows both parent and child processes to identically share the same process memory. So it's the same pages in memory. And this can make the, the system a lot more efficient. So, you know, if we go back to chapter three and we talk about process creation, when we create a process, it's allocating that memory, which is why I kind of wanted to talk about that process based in the beginning here. And it's got it's got its own layout and it's it's already configured. The more processes that that one process creates, or the more, more processes in general that we create, the more memory that's going to be allocated. So one of the ways that you can make the system more efficient is to make child processes share the parent process memory space, because not both of them are going to be running at the same time. One process that forks another process, you know, is referred to as the child process. The child process is going to run while the parent waits for the child. Why can't they share the same memory space? Why do we have to burden a system by creating another process out of that? Uh, so that makes the copy and write makes the process creation run faster. Uh, because we're not trying to go allocate, swap stuff out, swap stuff in, and you know, create a new process and go through the same identical work that it takes to create the original process. So it's a lot easier. If either process modifies a shared space, uh, modifies as your only when only then is that page copied as well. Um, so if the child gets a copy of the parent uh, when it is created, then we don't have to worry about it until a change happens. So if a change happens, only when the change is happening uh, do we worry about it, do we copy it. Otherwise we just leave it alone and the process essentially doesn't need to do anything. <laughs> And the copy on right allows more efficient process creation as only modified pages are also copied. Uh, which is kind of interesting because if we've got uh, to write something out, why waste, going back to what I said about before on the backing store and stuff like that, why waste writing something if it hasn't been changed? So we copy the information over when it's been changed and so which is where this copy on right is coming from. If there's been a write than, than updated. If not, no writes, just reads to the memory. Leave it alone. We don't have to worry about it. So that can copy and write as a concept can actually save processing time. Free pages are allocated from a pool of zeroed out pages that are emptied, essentially. Um, here's a before process one modifies page C. We've got process one over here, process two over here. We have two processes sharing. Unless, unless something is written, we don't have to worry about writing it. So we have process, uh, we have page A, B, and C, and that both, in physical memory, they're both process one and process two. This is, let's say process two is a child of process one. And uh, after the process one modifies page C, we don't actually have to do anything. Or no, actually after it modifies page C, it should be writing page C. This slide, I keep forgetting to edit this PowerPoint presentation, but this slide is wrong <laughs> because these two should be going away, and the C is the only one that really needs to be modified. Uh, so after process one modifies page C, C would be updated. And uh, but this slide here and this slide here are identical, uh, which is kind of pointless in terms of what's going on. <laughs> so this is the before, this is the after. Uh, but page C would be updated. So I have to edit this slide set so next time I do this. So what happens if there is no free frame? Hmm. We have page replacement. So, as I mentioned before, uh, pages have frames. Frames uh, get loaded up into the page table, and they get allocated toward the vi virtual memory. So, page replacement finds some page in memory, but not really in use, and swaps it out. That would be the perfect case scenario. If there's a frame, excuse me, if there's a page in memory, and it's not being used, not always the case. <laughs> so you have to think about, well, what about the least recently used? Or what about the last, you know, maybe use a time on it. Which one hasn't been used in a long time? Or which page is used a lot? Don't swap that one out. So we have selections, and the whole theory of the page replacement algorithm is to find the best routine that's going to do the lowest number of swapping for us. So we have an algorithm, and we have, this is, Kind of deceiving, deceiving. I should put an S on the end of this when I modify algorithms <laughs> to do page replacement. 
and uh, we have performance to consider. We want an algorithm which will result in a minimum number of page faults because we don't like page faults. And uh, the same page may be brought into memory several different times. So we want to minimize how many times we're bringing it into memory as well. So page replacement prevents overallocation of memory by modifying page fault service routines to include page replacement. So the service routine of the page fault, when the page fault occurs, is going to perform the page replacement. Uh, so it's not going to you know, randomly just do something. It's going to actually follow this algorithm technique. So here's where that dirty bit comes into. So dirty is modified. Um, so you use a modified bit or a dirty bit. You know, the old word used to be dirty. And, you know, cause, and then people say, well, wait a minute, it's not really dirty. It's just modified. You know, dirty gives that connotation of not being clean, you know, like it's dirty, it's messed up, it's garbage. When it really isn't garbage, it's not really dirty, it's just modified. So newer textbooks, this was, this was like till about like maybe the late 80s, and all of a sudden we started a modified bit. But people like, I like dirty bit, actually. So it sounds better, it sounds more like, it sounds more scientific, the dirty bit. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> So it's interesting that young kids' bachelor's degree programs, they go to the modified bit, they don't use the dirty anymore. So it's like, they modified bit. Oh, you mean dirty bit? Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Ah, it's the page that changed. It got modified. So to reduce the overhead of the page transfers, you only modify pages that are written to the disk. Uh, if the page, excuse me, you only write modified, modified pages are written to the disk, you only write the page if it has changed. If it has not changed, it's not dirty. No dirty bit set. And the dirty bit's either going to be set or not set. Then don't write it, because writing is going to be expensive time-wise. So page replacement completes separation between the logical memory and the physical memory. A large virtual memory can be provided on a smaller physical memory scale. So when we introduce page replacement to the concept, we don't even need as much physical memory anymore. So we can get systems that have a very small physical memory, for which we're using page replacement algorithms that are very fast. And then all of a sudden, we can essentially have a system that runs a lot quicker than given a lot more memory. So your choices are load up a lot of memory, have a very lousy page replacement, and hope it never works. Or hope, hopefully you will never have to use the page replacement. Because the more memory, physical memory you have, the less page replacement you're going to need. Or make this small and have a really good page replacement algorithm which is, you know, trade-offs, and this is expensive. So if you're building an operating system, it's kind of like one of the decisions you have to make. You know, it's like, and every operating system is going to have specs on the box, uh, you know. In fact, I think uh, Windows 7, I can't remember what it says, I think it's 4 gigs now. I think the original version, does anyone know? How, many memory, how much memory does Windows 7 require? I think it's like 4 gigs, isn't it? Mm, RAM. It used to be, remember when Windows XP came out, it was 1 gig. You had a no. Actually, it was 512. You could load it with 512, but everybody upgraded it to one gig, and then everyone went two gig standard. Two gig is pretty good on a Windows XP system, and then I believe seven doubled it or something. Uh, I could be wrong completely. Uh, so it might be an interesting experiment going online. Find what's the minimum memory requirement? Here's the interesting thing: the minimum memory requirement is for the operating system. So, you know, back at, I know the 512 was, I'm pretty sure, I'm 99.9% .9 positive the minimum requirement was 512 on an XP. So let me use that number as an example. The operating system will run just fine. And if anyone ever had an XP system that had 512 on it, probably notice it kind of runs a little slow otherwise. Because it's not using, it's, it's, it's not optimizing the, this memory management scheme. When you make it, one gig, let's say for example, you add in more on there. Less page replacement going on. Ah, so more memory, bigger space. So there's a trade-off between what happens when the page replacement doesn't have to occur, then we get to a certain point and the H operating system has a maximum. And it will only work, it will only use a certain amount of added on RAM. And at that point, you could put on all the RAM you want and it's not going to do it. It's not going to. It's not going to improve your page replacement because your operating system isn't going to use it, and it's not going to. Uh, it's not going to provide you any speed. It's like you know, you have a car as an example. Let's say 
you added something to the engine but you don't hook it up. <laughs> you put on a you know, accelerated something or other, but it's not connected to anything. Well, that's what happens. You can't do it because most manufacturers will tell you, you know, it only goes to a certain point. You know, it goes from two to eight gigs or something. And then after that point, the algorithm, which is already preset to work with a pre-configured environment, isn't even going to notice it. So we had that actually with uh, NT systems. Um, we took the, I believe there's no more of a requirement because the hardware itself is, re is setting the requirement. Like your board will only take four, gig four gigs of RAM or two gigs of RAM. And it's only expandable to a certain point. And that limit is always lower than what the operating system can take. <laughs> so we didn't really have a problem. But in the beginning, we did sort of have a problem. And I think it was with the NT system that people were loading on, you know, because NT's were, NT as an operating system was being installed on some more sophisticated higher-end hardware because it was meant to be servers. So people really invested a lot of money into the hardware. You put two gigs on it, it doesn't read it. It only uses one gig. You know, it's kind of a waste, actually. Uh, but NT's not even on the market anymore, and we've kind of worked past that concept. But uh, the need for the plays, page replacement algorithm is demonstrated in the slide you've been staring at. And this is sort of like that flow chart I went through with the page fault, where we have a PC actually stands for program counter. And so in the runtime environment, the program counter keeps track of the instruction. The instruction comes in and says, okay, load in. And this is the logical memory for user number one. This is the logical memory for user number two, and et cetera, um, which is basically how the system is, is separated out, usually by user, or by login, I should say. And then we have page table for number one, we have page table for number two in this particular configuration. And this is arbitrary. It doesn't necessarily have to be done this way. We get one page table for both users if we wanted to. On the right-hand column, we have our valid or invalid, and we have the page here. And this one's empty. We have one invalid, and these are all loaded. And uh, out here, going back there, we can map it through to the physical. And then we have some stuff out here. And uh, eventually, we're going to have to replace because we're going to run out. This is going to fill up. So page replacement algorithms replace the items in the pages that are mapped to the physical memory, that are mapped to the logical memory from the, from the, from the particular user. So you could say that this is the logical, this is the virtual, this is the physical. And the virtual really does work with page replacement in terms of what's going on. And the page replacement is nothing more than going to do the swap for us, load it into memory. Because eventually these guys are going to fill up this and we have no other choice. Basic page replacement. So what I'm going to kind of go through is a about three or four different, and I'll, I'll go through them quickly, just three or four different examples about how page replacement is done. And these are sort of the beginning page replacement algorithms. There's a lot more sophisticated algorithms on the market. Uh, but essentially, looking at this as our starting point, this is what we are juggling around. We find a location on the desired page on the disk. Okay, We find a free frame. If there is a free frame, we use it. If not, we have to create one. And that's where we get victims. So if there's no free frame, we use a page replacement algorithm to select a victim. And the victim might be out here if we're keeping track. And here's we're adding more overhead now to the system. If we want to keep track and say, well, we have it. User number one is using a lot. User number two has got a lot of stuff loaded already. You know, So they all have a lot of stuff loaded, which means we got to take user if user number one wants to do something, it might have to remove something from user number two. Or maybe we're going to keep track of it per user. We have to find a victim. The victim is going to be someone who might actually be valid, who might, well, it is valid for somebody else. Something that might actually be in use, but we can't. I can't. We have to make, it's a sacrifice. We have to, we have to pull it out. So we bring the desired page into memory, into the newly free frame that is created. And then we update the page in the frame tables to uh, indicate that this is now valid, and then we restart the process. So the basic page replacement is nothing, doing nothing more than picking the victim and using, okay, now you're going away, now we're going to load some stuff into you, and now you're, you're the, now going to represent the page. And here's our victim out here. We swap out the victim page, because we're going to keep it, and then we swap back in the, the page that we actually needed to be loaded. 
and then we update the page table. And we update the page table with uh, now we have this this free frame that was valid or f I'm sorry f got loaded in here where the victim frame was. So we changed uh, to invalid from the first step when we swapped it out, and then we swapped it back in and we reset the page table for the new page. So it's nothing more, the page replacement by concept is nothing more than taking something that's in memory, unloading it, taking something that's been unloaded, putting it back into memory, and putting it back into the same spot, into that victim location where we pulled something out of. So. I don't know why students have a hard time understanding this. You guys seem to, you know, no questions or anything, so you guys seem to be getting it, but yeah. It's, it's funny, I, I won't know until the final exam. <laughs> I want to ask you a question about page replacement, and then people will answer in such a funny, different way. It's like, what is page? What is swapping? Hmm. <laughs> and swapping, you know, and it's like, and then you answer. You pick the you pick the item on the multiple choice that has nothing to do with memory, <laughs> and then I go, oh, wow, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about swapping. I never thought of it that way before. So, page replacement algorithms. Uh, you want the lowest number of page faults. That's something actually, I know I'm going to ask you questions about page faults and I'm going to ask the questions about page replacement algor algorithms and stuff like that. That's fun. So, and CPU scheduling. That stuff's fun too. So you evaluate the algorithm by running on a particular string of memory references. You have a reference string, let's say for example, and then you compute the number of page faults on that string. So what we're going to do is run through an example with this particular example string here. And we're going to compare the number of page faults. The one with the lowest number of page faults is going to give us the best, most efficient runtime. So here's our reference string. And it's just a bunch of references, sort of like in this particular example here, when using all of these, you know, ones and Ds and Es and Fs and whatever. We're just going to take this reference string and compare it. So here's a graph of page faults versus number of frames. So the number of frames that are available versus the number of page faults. When the frames are small, we have one page as an example. We have really small, less than 512. <laughs> number of frames is very, very small. We have a lot of page faults. More frames, fewer page faults, lower numbers, so which is why the kind of curve goes down this way. About five frames, it looks like in our particular example, it's kind of leveling off. So even if we had 10 frames, it's probably going to still generate four, four page faults or something. So it's kind of an interesting shape curve that's predictable in terms of uh, most of our algorithms. And this is kind of the efficiency, the graph that we're going to kind of compare things to. The basic first in, first out algorithm. So this is our reference stream from the previous slide, and we're going to start comparing these algorithms. We have three frames. Let's say, so our search space is three, so three pages can be in memory at a time per process. Now imagine up here, the three is right here, which, you know, we're going to come out with an average number of page files. It looks like about six, maybe five, five and a half. So we have nine pages or ten pages that we're going to load in, but we only have three frames. Uh, so we have, in terms of our three frame example with one, two, three, we have these particular items that are going to be loaded into it. On four frames, we could come out with, let's say, a 10-page fault versus a 9-page fault. We added, uh, we added another page. So Bradley's anonymously, the more frames, the more number of fra page faults, uh, which is kind of interesting. So the more frames we have, the higher the page fault rate could possibly come in. And this is with using a first-in, first-out. Because we have more swap, well, we, we're going to have more swapping that's going on uh, in terms of the con in terms of this configuration. So, in terms of our, of our reference stream string, using a first in first out, and the first in first out is going to say we started with one two one two three, and then we have four one four one two, and then we have here five. Uh, I get, uh, numbers are wrong here. Oh, we had to swap out. We had some page faults going on here. And uh, we eventually had the five, the three, and the four loaded in. We started out okay. The first in is the first out because we're going to fill it up in order of how big things are from our first in. And then the, uh, the later ones that come in are going to have a problem <laughs> because of the way this configuration, the way these frames are organized. So. This is another representation of the same example in terms of the page frames. 
and how the page frames are loaded in. So this is just showing you the sequence. So number one was the seven, and then we had the seven and the zero, the seven and zero and the one. I'm not going to go through it, but this is essentially the logic of what's going on here. Zero is nothing. So, or no, zero, no, actually zero got loaded in here somewhere. He's down here. Two, zero, three, two, zero. Well, that got swapped out. Three. But uh, we're loading up those pages with the reference with the reference string. And then here's our number of frames. As our number of frames goes higher, or excuse me, goes bigger, our number of page faults go down. So we have that. We have the, the sort of average kind of curve that happens. And what we're going to have is essentially the same type of graph for each one of these algorithms. Optimal algorithm. So replace the pages that will not be used for the longest number of time, longest period of time. Something to note here, this first inference of this is an algorithm for page faults, excuse me, for page replacement. And it follows through the basic anomaly with saying, you know, the more frames, the more number of page faults. There gets to a certain point where it, you know, the number of frames balances. And we're filling it up and we're unloading it in a first in, first out. If we take and use an optimal algorithm approach to this, in our case here we might have four frames in this example, one, two, three, four. And we have six page faults because we have, we're going to use it one, two, one, two, three, four, four. And we're going to have a page fault. I'm going to be loading them stuff in. How do we know this? Well, it's used for measuring how well our algorithm is going to actually be performed. So we have to have some sort of criteria for measuring. And what we generally come up with is how many page faults are going to occur given how big, how many frame size. And then we can configure. Given the amount of memory that we want in our virtual memory, how big to make that <laughs> to match the physical to reduce the number of page faults? It will get to a certain point where the number of page faults will increase versus decreasing. Uh, so in terms of our optimal page replacement, this is just yet another example of loading the string in in terms of how we're going to load it. And uh, the optimal one is only going to replace it. It's not used for the... It's, Repla replace pages that will not be used for the longest period of time in terms of the strategy because uh, you know replace the ones that aren't going to be accessed over and over again so we'll minimize the amount of swapping that we have to do. Or the least recently used algorithm which is a little bit more promising actually uh, in terms of our reference string using the same one loading that up into the sequential you know, one right after the other. We could implement it, and here's the interesting thing. So the first in, first out algorithm here takes absolutely no overhead in terms of the algorithm outside of the configuration of how you're going to load the reference string and how you're going to allocate it. And then you can figure out, well, with three, I got nine. With four, I got ten. So I got, wow, well, you know, my page faults are going up. So at a certain point, page faults aren't going to go up anymore. And that's pretty much the calculation that we have to work with that. On the optimal algorithm, we have to figure out which victim we're going to pick. And the victim that we pick is going to be on the theory of the longest, you know, the pages that will not be used for the longest period of time. So we're not going to unload operating system stuff. We're, not, we're going to be biased, essentially. We're going we're to pre, predetermine what we're going to unload as a victim. In terms of our least recently used algorithm, we actually have to keep track. And this is where counting or indexes come into place. So in terms of a counter implementation, we can keep track and count which page has been the least recently used. And then we take that one, we swap it out and on a goal of basically creating less swapping, fewer number of page faults. So every page entry has a counter. Well, there's extra overwork. There's Going back to what I said about the algorithms and the efficiency, well, it's a search space, but it's also number of loops, complexity in terms of what's going on. We've got algorithm. This is going to add to the efficient, this is going to decrease from the efficiency of the algorithm because you're adding more complexity to it. Uh, you're going to put in a counter for each one of the pieces. Every time a page is referenced through the entry, there's going to be a copy of the clock into the counter. You're going to update the counter. So when a page needs to be changed, you look at the counters to determine which ones you're going to change, which one you're going to take out, the least recently used, hopefully. And so the way this works, where we're at with our reference string here, we're loading it in, and this kind of mimics, you know, if you were going to take the least recently used page, and, you know, and we're not, I'm not going to show you the counter, but this is essentially uh, the execution that would happen in a sequential kind of way. 
we can implement it in a stack, which would eliminate the counter. So keep track, keep a stack of page numbers in a double linked form. So we have a page reference, and then we move it up to the top. Stack implementation for least recently used is very promising because it doesn't add to the algorithm complexity. It's using a data structure to organize the strings. So it requires six pointers to be changed. You have to constantly update the pointers. However, it, uh, there's no search for a replacement. There's no thinking. So there's no search slower, excuse me, faster. You're not, you're not going to be slowed down by the search. So if you use a stack to record the most recently paged reference, you just pop it off the stack. So now we have it like two would be replaced, one, seven here, seven, two. Excuse me, after I pulled off two and one or zero, I have seven, put seven back on the stack after B. Here's B, seven's coming back on. Um, and so we would pop one off, push one back on, pop one off, push one back on, and use the data structure instead of having to use a counter or another algorithm to mimic that. So we have least recently used approximation algorithms. So we could keep a reference bit so that each page associates a bit. And here we go again with more bits that we're adding to the configuration. So when the page is referenced, uh, when page is referenced, we set the bit to one, and uh, we replace the one with a zero if one exists. And uh, we don't know the order. Uh, we don't really care about the order. Instead, we're sort of keeping an approximation by setting a, an on or an off, essentially. And then we have a second chance. So the second chance would uh, need a reference bit and a clock replacement. And so if the page is replaced in the clock order, it has a reference bit of equal to 1 is equal, is equal to 1. If that's the case, we set the reference bit to 0, we leave the page in memory, and we replace the next page. So we can approximate with a little bit more efficiency than running a true algorithm either using a stack or a counter implementation. And it shows promising. With our second chance clock and our page replacement algorithm here, we can say that this is going to be the next victim and then that's going to be the next victim. So we can run a circular queue of pages and essentially go through with an approximation. Also with a stack, but we're just not keeping a, we're not keeping very much information. Um, so the the lowest amount of information that you can keep in terms of the algorithm, the more, more simple you can make the algorithm, and if you could use approximations for it, um, then uh, your, fast, your, your, your algorithm is going to run efficient, or a lot faster than it would otherwise, either by keeping a reference bit and then, or a second chance, second chance kind of opportunity. Counting algorithms. So keep a counter of the number of references that have been made to each page. Could you imagine the amount of overhead associated with that? Every time you access something, accessed something in memory, a counter was increased. <laughs> so, these recently, um, you can have come out with the most frequently used or the least frequently used algorithm. If you're keeping a counter, the least frequently used is going to replace the smallest count. The most frequently used is based on the algorithm of the page with the smallest count that is probably just brought in and has yet to be used. Uh, so we can kind of keep, uh, in fact there's another philosophy to this as well that wasn't mentioned. Um, you know, least recently used is kind of giving you the impression that something is loaded in and maybe it's not being used anymore. You know, like the, the user has moved on, they're doing more work. And you have to imagine it's kind of like the psychology of the user that the operating system design is using, the operating system designer is using with that. And then, you know, the concept of, well, something is used a lot and then it was just brought into memory, which means, you know, the user could have brought it up, and then now it's going to go into something else. And if you just brought it up into memory, are you still using it? So, so it's kind of like uh, operating system psychology <laughs> of the user as to uh, which victim was actually more appropriate. Um, in terms of the allocation of the frames, and it depends on uh, whatever configuration you're going to make it, and whatever configuration for the allocation of the frames is going to essentially be associated with the type of algorithm that you're going to use to allocate the frames. Each process needs a minimum number of frames that's going to be associated with it. And it's preset. You could, uh, if you wanted to, 
you could not make each process have an equal amount of memory. And when I talked about, uh, I believe it was chapter three a couple weeks back, we talked about processes and allocation of processes and the amount of memory that's allocated. Most systems are going to use a fair set amount. You know, every process is going to get the same amount of memory. But we could have different priorities of processes, add them, give them, allocate them more memory. And if that's the case, then they're going to occupy a higher percentage of the memory that's available. So your replacement algorithm might be adjusted to not touch higher percentage frames versus lower percentage ones, depending upon the nature of the system now going back into the what's the user doing. Well, we can also consider the kernel as a separate psychology of the kernel, you know, like what, what's the kernel going to be doing with that memory? You know, so, which is kind of like the scheme of why most kernel processes are always, you know, in every operating system, they're always loaded at the lower level because they're accessed more often. So you want the access to the memory to be optimal, uh, and that would be like the seek time, to be very optimal for the operating system, for the kernel, because those are the most important processes that are going to be used constantly. So the least recently used stuff that the user's loading, we'll put it on top, put it far away, so that, uh, you know, it's not going to be found as quickly, but, uh, you know, it's more swappable, essentially. And then you could segment out the memory if you wanted to, and don't swap out anything kernel-related, so it's all protected. So after a certain point, the user space starts, and then the memory is mapped to the user space, which is different memory that's mapped to the kernel space, and voila, there you have Linux, <laughs> or Unix, <laughs> or it's separation. And the Unix kernel always has better memory, always has more memory allocated to it, even if it's not even using it. It always has faster access time to it because it's always in the lower level of the memory bank. So it's easier to find, and there's less swapping. So the user mode is not going to swap out a kernel level anything at all. It's going to be protected. So here's some more examples of a, an IBM 370 that has six pages to handle an SS move instruction. The instruction is six bytes, so it might span two pages, so two pages to handle the from, two pages to handle the to, and then we have two major allocation schemes that might be associated with that, and this is what I was kind of alluding to, the fixed allocation versus the priority allocation. So if we have a priority allocation system, that's what I just talked about. If we said the kernel is a higher level priority, and we're not going to allocate, we're not going to swap out any of those frames they were, we're making some frames more important than other frames, which if they're more important, they're not going to be victims, perhaps, so they're not going to be they're not going to be part of the page replacement algorithm. We can also take and separate out and apply different page replacement algorithms to different memory segments and separate the memory per per, per purpose. Or we could take another approach to it in combination. And the interesting thing is these approaches are kind of separate concepts, but a lot of them are done together is to do a fixed allocation scheme. A fixed allocation just treats everybody the same, every process gets the same amount, all the memory gets used equally throughout the system. So in terms of a fixed process allocation scheme, we have equal allocation, for example, there are a hundred different frames and five processes, each one is going to get 20 frames. So we're going to allocate it all out. No one's going to do that because you're going to give out more, you're going to give out more frames to different processes that don't necessarily need it. So, I mean, you're going to waste, you're going to have internal, <laughs> internal memory leftover frames, perhaps, maybe not. It depends on how much memory you're actually allocating out. Or you could do proportional allocation, allocate according to the size of the process, which is a little bit more efficient. So don't give the process more than the process actually needs. In that case, the size is going to be uh, fixed at a certain length, and then uh, the number of it, we're going to cal we can actually calculate it out, and I'm not going to go through the calculation, I'll save you that, but uh, we can kind of see, you know, the differences between what efficiency we're going to achieve using one or the other. In terms of the priority allocation, we use a, and I'm not going to ask you on a final to perform any calculation on estimated access time or number of frames needed or average, you could probably do an average page fault rate if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to ask you those questions. Uh, priority allocation. So I uh, basically described it a few minutes ago, but you use a proportional allocation scheme using priorities rather than size. And so we say kernel's got better priority, for example. So if process P1 generates page fault, select a replacement one of its frames and uh, select replacement a frame from a process with a lower priority number. 
So lower priority numbers are freeing up their frames for higher priority processes that are running. So that's usually how it actually kind of works in the true operating system environment. Because some things you have to have loaded. So you have to put a priority at one point. So to kind of wrap up the allocation concepts, we have local versus global allocation. In a global replacement, processes are, you select a process for replacement from a set of all frames. One process can take another frame from another, uh, you know, can take a frame from another, meaning it's not set by user by the user. And one of the examples we saw, I had a page replacement algorithm, excuse me, a page replace page table set for one user and the other user had its own page table. If you're using a global replacement scheme, you could merge everything together and have all processes share all, all frames. In terms of local, each process selects from its own set of allocated frames. Because the process itself has memory, the process is doing a lot of number crunching, doing a lot of manipulation, and it, uh, it, it needs space you know, it's probably not going to use something else while it's running another piece of memory. So in that particular case, it makes a lot of sense to just have the process manage its own memory space and not go outside in a global. So I've actually already covered threshing, so I'm going to hit it sort of just kind of quickly to just review it from in terms of the definition. If a process does not have enough pages, the page fault rate is very high, it leads to thrashing, and leads to low CPU utilization. Because the CPU is busy swapping in and swapping out. So that it's busy, but it's not doing anything. So that's why they call it a low CPU utilization. It's not being utilized correctly. It's not efficient. Um, so operating system thinks that it needs to increase the degree of multi-programming. So another process is added to the system perhaps, and that just causes even more problems. So thrashing is a process is busy swapping pages in and out. So here's your definition of thrashing. As the degree of multi-programming increases, it will reduce the number. Of the, it will reduce the amount of thrashing, um, essentially. So the CPU utilization will come up to a thrashing point, and then increase the degree of multi-programming, which means you know, go switch to another program, switch to create a new process, switch to another process. That helps reduce the thrashing. So demand paging and thrashing. Why does Demand paging work? Well, it's locality model. In terms of the locality model, a process migrates from one locality to another. So localities are, may overlap as well. Why does thrashing occur? Well, because the size of the locality is larger than the total memory size. And we don't have enough memory. <laughs> so thrashing is a no-brainer. We're going to thrash when we don't have enough memory. And when, if we have a very low level of multiprocessing, it's going to continue to thrash, and it's going to end up with a situation where the computer is just going to turn off. This graph is kind of hard to see, but it says execution time on the bottom. It says page numbers and memory addresses, and it's kind of showing you a thrashing situation where it has to move from one process to another in order to actually remove. And that, that's why multiprocessing, the degree of multiprogramming, when you increase it, it reduces the thrashing because you have other things to work with. You have, you're not stuck on that one process. You, have, you can just create another process and have that other process do work, which is essentially getting work done versus the CPU just sitting thrashing on one particular process. Uh, we have this thing called the working set model. It's another kind of subtopic that is associated with this. We have a working set window is equal to a fixed number of page references. And so we have, let's say, as an average of 10,000, excuse me, yeah, 10,000 instructions. The working set model of the process could be equal to the total number of pages referenced in the most recent, or you know, most recent time of execution, which might also vary. Um, I never actually cover the working set model because it's kind of an old theory in terms of uh, uh, estimating, um, th uh, basically, you know, level of multiprogramming versus thrashing. So I'm going to kind of skip the working set model because we don't need it for the purposes of this class. Uh, but the fault, uh, page fault frequency schemes establish an acceptable page fault rate is a goal of all of these page replacement algorithms. Uh, the idea is not to have any page faults, uh, but we're going to have it. And we can calculate the efficiency by the number or by the rate. So if actual rate is too low, process loses frames. If actual rate is too high, process gains frames. Um, and then we 
can kind of adjust in sort of a real-time fashion. Given the number of page faults, we can apply a different algorithm, or we could possibly tweak the algorithm in terms of its, in terms of its efficiency. So, uh, Another related concept is the memory mapped files that we looked at, and that was actually in one of the slides earlier. So the memory mapped files for I.O. allows files to be treated as routine access, memory access, by mapping a disk block to the page in memory. So we take something from the secondary storage from the hard drive, we put it up into memory, and that's another way of using memory, and we can map them per process, we can map them in between processes. So we can have multiple processes share the same file in a memory mapped kind of mode. So the file is initially read using a demand paging. Demand pages memory mapped files are not normally written out or swapped. They're sort of a special case in which we're going to load something up in, we have a pointer to it in memory, and we're going to use it. And we're going to use it, and then we're going to close it, hopefully, and take it out. So memory mapped files are generally controlled by the application level, or by the user, or by the kernel who's going to map the file. So the page size is usually proportionate to the file that is read in and from the system, from the physical page itself, and so subsequent reads and writes from the pile are treated as ordinary memory accesses. So going back to what I, hopefully I told you at the last lecture and when we went over main memory in lecture 8, I said that memory that's farthest away from the CPU is the slowest. It's also the cheapest, but it's the slowest access time. So the farthest piece of memory away from the CPU is the hard drive, and those files out there take a long time to read in. So you want to increase the amount of uh, time, or excuse me, decrease the amount of time, increase the efficiency of your slower memory, you bring it in, you bring it closer. The only way to bring it closer is to map it. So if you memory map the secondary storage from an operating system's perspective, you've increased the access time. Or, excuse me, you've decreased the access time, you've made it more efficient, you've increased the efficiency. So you write low-level system call interfaces to read and write, and that's where we get the simplified file access by treating the I.O. from memory rather than using a read and a write as a system call. We access it from memory, and uh, we end up with uh, essentially a faster access. So it allows several different processes to map to the same file as well, allowing the page to be shared. So memory mapped files are done for sharing, they're done for efficiency, um, and uh, they basically uh, are a good concept if you have the memory available. So here we have process A that's in virtual memory, and we have process B that's in virtual memory. And if we load the files in another location, here's our, here's our physical memory out here, and we have a disk file that's being loaded. Both processes can access the same file, the same shared memory. And uh, it make, makes for a lot of sh file sharing and inter-process communication. You know. If you have multiple processes doing that, you can have multiple processes working on the same job, as I mentioned before. Here's process number one, process number two, and here's our shared memory in Windows where we have a memory mapped file out here. If you haven't noticed, it's kind of, um, it is sort of the same abstraction as you get uh, in most operating systems, but uh, this is, you know, basically representing how it's performed in Windows. So. We have allocated kernel memory, as I mentioned before. It's treated differently from user memory, has a higher priority, it's loaded lower in memory. It's allocated, often allocated from free memory pool. Kernel requests memory for structures for various different sizes. Some kernel memory needs to be contiguous, uh, just in the nature of how it was designed. Um, and it's usually loaded, loaded in the lower, lower box. Another related concept, and what I'm doing now is just kind of going through some uh, miscellaneous related concepts that are associated. Uh, no, more, no more paging stuff left. Uh, the buddy system allocates memory from a fixed size segment consisting of physical contiguous pages. And so we have a memory allocation using a power of two allocator. So it satisfies requests uh, in units size of a power of two. So when the uh, small allocation is needed, uh, when it's available, current chunk is split into two buddies uh, to the lower power of two. So it continues until the approximate size chunks are available. So we, we keep splitting. We allocate it in power two, and we split it out to deallocate it to, to assign it. Here's our buddy system allocator, our physical contiguous pages. We break it out, we break it out, we break it out again until we end up with a size that's needed for a particular task.
per allocation. Another variation on that would be the slab allocator, and these are just different ways of allocating the memory, allocating the frame. So it's an alternative strategy. The slab is one or more physically contiguous pages. So we cache is consistent of a, one or more slabs. So we use a slab abstraction. So instead of a buddy, instead of splitting it out, we have a single cache for each one of the unique kernel data structures. Each cache is filled with objects, instantiations of the data structure itself. When the uh, cache is created, we fill the objects marked as free. So basically the same concept as before. Call it a free front frame, call it a free slab, call it a buddy. <laughs> they all contain uh, empty frames that we want to fill with information. So here's our slab. So we have three kilobit object here, a seven kilobit object. And we've got slabs here that are allocated. It's just in a, instead of calling it a page, calling it a slab, we're allocating it with a pre-configured scheme. And you might get the impression, hopefully at this point, that every person who creates an operating system has their choice. You know, it's, there's no one way of doing this. And so operating systems vary with their memory management, and uh, which is one of the most significant differences between different operating systems. Especially, uh, you know, given the example I gave you earlier in the lecture, comparing Windows with um, Java, totally different, totally different kind of memory management configuration. And they're designed, they're specifically designed for the purposes. I mean, Windows is multi-programming. Windows is multitasking, loading up a lot of Windows. Java is communication between objects. So everything is a shared memory. Um, in fact, this is, this is a shared memory uh, configuration of Java. Um, everything is loaded this way. So It's also a Windows kind of scheme as well. So. Other issues perhaps with pre-paging. Uh, paging to reduce uh, the large number of frame fault, the faults that occur at process startup. So prepare all of the same, or all or some of the pages uh, a process is going to need before they are referenced. Which means you're going to kind of predict, instead of using a just-in-time, kind of if the memory is available, load it. Thinking it's probably going to use it anyway, hopefully. So. Maybe other issues may also be associated with the page size, so page size selection. Um, taking into consideration fragmentation, table size, I.O. overhead, or locality. So yeah, the, the page size is definitely uh, a consideration as well. Maybe looking at a uh, look-aside buffer, transaction look-aside buffer, or some sort of a memory access. Uh, you know, so taking a look at the amount of accessible memory from the look-aside buffer going back to the main memory lecture we had. Um, in terms of the definition of that, can be implemented from a hardware or from a software perspective. Um, we are almost done, so don't worry. <laughs> I see people looking at their watches already. Um, I normally skip through this stuff pretty quickly because I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. Uh, in terms of what you need to get out of this lecture is the main concept of virtual memory and paging. Page replacement as a concept and swapping. These other issues, and I call them other issues is because it's... Uh, side considerations, things that go along with the topic that you can implement, uh, you know, in terms of looking at the hardware support, looking at, uh, here's another issue, I.O. interlock, you know, pages that must sometimes be locked into memory, not uh, allowing them to be accessed, so considering the I.O. itself. Reasons why frames are used for I.O. must be in memory, in terms of a, a buffer. Um, we see this in terms of buffered I.O., um, with not only the disk drive, but with CD-ROM drives and other things. Buffered I.O. actually takes memory as well. That's another concept to consider. So, I'm not going to cover the operating system examples because I've given them to you already. <laughs> we've already talked about Windows and we've already talked about uh, the Unix, but uh, just to kind of put it into a summary for you, Windows does use demand paging. It does it with clustering. And clustering brings a page in surrounded to, surrounding the page fault itself. So processes are designed with a working set minimum and a working set maximum. Um, we have an automatic working set uh, trimming that works. So it automatically adjusts, actually. It's supposed to automatically adjust. So. In terms of Solaris, it maintains a list of free pages. It works from a free, page, free, free pages list to assign faults uh, to each one of the process. So. In fact, this is kind of outdated. This is like a maybe about eight years old. So I'm not going to cover the particulars because in each breed of, and this is just Solaris uh, sun, sun Systems, HPUX, 
modern day Linux, Unix systems are all going to have a sort of a different configuration. Uh, they're all going to use paging, but they're all going to use a separate priority or a separate uh, allocation type scheme. So that is everything you ever wanted to know about virtual memory in Chapter Nine, and. Uh, Kind of a long lecture, but I, it did cover a lot of summary information uh, that hopefully you found helpful. So next week we will move on to a bigger and better topic. I have no idea what it is yet. So questions, comments, concerns? Then we're done. We are done for today. Thank you for staying. <laughs>